Um, my name is uh, Leslie Scout, and I am a uh, professor of diagnostic radiology and surgery at Yale New Haven Hospital, and I'm here representing the AIUM. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the workup of patients who have a clinical suspicion of renal colic or renal stones. And really, the challenge for this uh, presentation is that in the United States, non-contrast CT would be considered the gold standard for this evaluation. But what I hope to show you at the end of this uh, discussion is that, at least in certain clinical situations, I think it is appropriate to consider doing ultrasound first, and I have no disclosures relative to this presentation. In terms of background, uh, renal colic or renal stones are an increasingly common problem in the United States. It's estimated that 10, excuse me, 12 to 14 percent of men and 6 percent of women over their lifetime will have at least one episode of renal colic. Uh, there is variation in the literature about uh, some of the numbers I'm going to uh, now present to you, but it's estimated that between 600,000 and a million ED visits occur in the United States per year, and the health care cost is probably somewhere between $2 billion and in some articles as high as $5.3 billion a year. So this is a big problem. The classical clinical presentation is that of acute onset of extraordinarily severe uh, spasmodic and episodic uh, flank pain. It kind of comes and goes. The pain is so severe it's often associated with nausea and vomiting, and it may radiate to the groin, and in probably about 85 percent of cases, there is some associated microscopic hematuria. Now, if you take patients who have this very classic clinical presentation, one study in Europe demonstrated or reported that the clinical accuracy of making the diagnosis of renal calculi was about a 89% uh, sensitivity with a 99% specificity if patients presented with all of these symptoms. The problem is that very often these patients present with more nonspecific symptoms, vaguer symptoms, and there is an extraordinarily long differential diagnosis that often may require alternative uh, intervention or therapy, such as appendicitis, diverticulitis, pyelonephrosis, and in women, of course, OBGYN pelvic pathology. So if you have a patient that has clinical suspicion of renal colic, the question that you should ask, of course, why would you image? And there are really four reasons that you would image such a patient. Well, first and foremost, you might image in order to establish the diagnosis. And if that's your primary goal, it's really quite clear that the most sensitive and specific means of establishing or detecting a renal calculus is non-contrast CT. And since the initial study that actually came out of Yale in uh, 1996, numerous people have uh, published uh, trials and um, or a series of patients, I've only listed three here, indicating that the sensitivity of non-contrast CT for detecting stones is as high as 98 percent with a specificity in many of these series uh, of 100 percent. Now if you're going to, to not do a CT and do an ultrasound first, as I'm going to suggest would be appropriate in some situations, if you add a KUB that will increase your sensitivity, but even those two things combined are clearly less sensitive for detection of renal calculi than the non-contrast CT, particularly for small stones less than three millimeters or stones that are located within the mid ureter. Another reason to image these patients is to exclude other pathology. And there have been several series that have reported that non-contrast CT will identify alternative diagnosis that requires treatment or intervention in as many as 5 to 15 percent of patients who have a clinical suspicion of renal colic. And this is particularly true, of course, in patients who present with atypical clinical scenarios. Another thing that can be very important in terms of imaging is to determine the size and the location of the stone. And this is very important for management as well as prognosis. Because the smaller a stone is and the more distal it is in the ureter, the more likely it is to pass spontaneously with hydration and pain medicine and not require intervention. I've listed a couple of references here which demonstrate that if stones are less than five millimeters, they have close to about a 60 to 70 percent likelihood of passing spontaneously. And stones at the distal uh, UV junction have about a 79 percent likelihood of passing. Whereas if you have a stone in the proximal ureter, there's only about a 
a 48% chance of passing. So many institutions have an algorithm where they take the axial width of the stone as well as its location, and they can predict whether or not intervention is going to be required or whether or not it's appropriate to manage the patient conservatively with hydration as well as pain medication. And certainly all studies would agree that any stone over the size of uh, one centimeter is extremely unlikely to pass. And the last reason to consider doing imaging is to document whether or not there's hydronephrosis uh, present or obstruction. And this is important for patient management, particularly if the patient has decreased renal function or there's some sort of concern for infection because, again, intervention and decompression might therefore be more immediately required. And in terms of looking for hydronephrosis, I believe that ultrasound and non-contrast contrast CT are equivalent in their sensitivity and specificity. But clearly, for both modalities, the sensitivity depends upon the duration of symptoms. And it usually takes four to eight hours following the onset of symptoms before hydronephrosis will develop. So with that as a background, in the United States, the gold standard for evaluation patients with renal colic has been considered the non-contrast enhanced CT. And in 2011, the American College of Radiology gave appropriateness ratings to various imaging modalities. And on a scale of 1 to 9, with 9 being the most appropriate, they gave non-contrast CT an 8, and they gave ultrasound plus the KUB a score of 6, although they did say in the small print this should be preferred in pregnant patients. So what is the problem or the potential risk of doing, uh, of following this approach? Because that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today. Well, first of all, this is very, very expensive. And the expense includes not just the cost of the CT, but also includes the cost of discovering clinically insignificant findings that may require further uh, workup. Another problem is radiation exposure, and the National Academy of Sciences has endorsed a concept of a linear no-threshold model of risk of radiation exposure, and what that means is that the more radiation you're exposed to, you're higher your, your risk of developing cancer, and there is no threshold number below which it's believed to be completely safe to be exposed to radiation therapy. Now, Dr. Banasarath has already presented the first article I've listed here, which um, was uh, published in the uh, Archives of Internal Medicine in 2009, reporting that if you take all the patients who had CTs done in the United States in the year 2007, you probably can predict that 29,000 cancers will uh, occur in the future as a direct result of those CTs. Uh, Dr. Smith Bidman from San Francisco in that same um, uh, journal uh, volume reported uh, a different study estimating what the lifetime cancer risk was from a non-contrast CT. And of course, the risk depends on it's higher in women than in men, it's higher in younger patients than in older patients, but she reported there was a risk of developing a cancer in one of 5,000, excuse me, one of 500 uh, 20 year old women that had CT and one in um, 1,330 for a 60 year old male. So, this risk of developing a cancer is measurable and not um, insignificant. And clearly, this concern becomes even higher uh, when you consider cumulative radiation uh, dose in patients who have recurrent symptoms of renal colic. And this is a very a significant problem because it's estimated that at least half of all patients who have one episode of renal colic will end up having at least a second episode sometime in the future. This was an article at Yale that looked at patients who had recurrent symptoms and they uh, reported that here at a very prominent academic institution, there was at least one patient in a six-year period who ended up having 18 CT scans. This was another study that looked at 306 patients who presented with renal colic in a 10-month period, and then they were followed up longitudinally. And of those 306 patients, 92 had three CT scans, and there was one patient each who had 14, 22, and 25 CT scans. And so the cumulative radiation dose and therefore risk in these patients really is enormous. And so because of this, when the ACR gave appropriateness ratings in patients with recurrent symptoms, they actually lowered the number for CT 
and they raised the number for ultrasound and they gave them equivalent ratings of seven in the setting of recurrent symptoms. Another problem is that you have to ask yourself this question whenever you image, whenever you spend money, does it help you? And so does doing a non-contrast CT actually improve patient care? And this is a very interesting study that documented that between 1996 and 2007, at their institution, there was a tenfold increase in CT utilization. However, there was no change in the frequency of the diagnosis of renal stone disease, the diagnosis of alternative pathology, or admission for renal calculi. And this is another study from the University of Rochester who looked at changes in outcome. They measured uh, whether or not there were admissions for renal colic or revisit rates following the introduction of non-contrast CT and evaluation of these patients. And again, they found no change, just increased utilization of healthcare dollars. So how do you fix this? How do you reduce the cancer risk? Well, clearly, you can consider doing low-dose non-contrast CT. And this is a very um, active avenue of ongoing research in the United States and Europe. And these are several studies reported out of Europe that if you use these low-dose CT algorithms, you have about 100% or close to 100% sensitivity for detecting renal stones, uh, at least stones that are greater than 2 to 3 millimeters in, and this is very important, the non-obese patient. But questions still remain. Nobody really knows the sensitivity of these low-dose CTs for detecting other pathology. There are many, many different algorithms for reducing a, a CT a radiation dose, and they may have different sensitivities and specificities. In addition, these trials were done in Europe, and of course we have, unfortunately, many more obese patients in the United States, but trials are ongoing in the United States, and actually one of our next speakers has federal funding to look at this uh, at Yale. So we come then to the question is why might we consider doing uh, ultrasound first? Well, it's cheap, it's widely available, no ionizing radiation, and it really does have equivalent sensitivity for the detection of hydronephrosis, and this probably is enough in a patient with classic symptoms to confirm your diagnosis. It is clearly less sensitive for the detection of stones, particularly these small stones that are located in the mid-ureter. But again, a very good uh, series reported from Europe demonstrating that if you take ultrasound plus the KUB, it had a pretty high sensitivity for detecting stones, 79%, certainly less than CT, which in this series was 93%. But the key feature is here that the only stones that were missed were the stones that were less than three millimeters, all of which passed spontaneously without requiring intervention. So their conclusion was that yes, it is true that the non-contrast CT is more sensitive for the detection of stones, but it doesn't really affect patient outcome and it's really not necessary in terms of patient management. The problems with ultrasound, of course, is that it's operator dependent and it is time consuming. And so to maximize your sensitivity, you're going to have to look at the kidney. It's easy to see the hydronephrosis, but it's harder to see the ureter and you have to follow the ureter down till you can see the stone in the upper ureter. You have to be certain to look at the UV junction down at the bladder because that's a very common place for stones to hang up. And sometimes you need to look with endovaginal ultrasound in order to see the stone when you can't see it well, uh, just on the transabdominal imaging. And of course, sometimes you're going to use your color Doppler to see twinkle artifact or your bladder jets, sometimes even spectral Doppler to see if there's a change in resistive index in the kidney, because that also can uh, help convince you that you're dealing with obstruction. So I'm going to suggest these following algorithms. If you have a pregnant patient and you have real concern about radiation exposure, not just to the woman but towards the fetus, consider doing ultrasound first. Consider the ultrasound plus the KUB first in a patient with recurrent symptoms who has a classic clinical presentation. As I've said, hydronephrosis will confirm your diagnosis. And sometimes, uh, maybe as many as 79% of the time, you can find the stone, you can measure it, you can determine the location. But to do this, of course, you have to look hard. And if you're going to do the non-contrast CT, you should always use the reduced dose protocol. 
And consider this really in the patients who've had a negative ultrasound in the KUB to start with, who have an atypical presentation, signs of infection, patients who are not improving with conservative management, and possibly it's something you should think about in the patient who presents with symptoms for the very first time. But this is a change in how we manage patients in the United States. And so if we're going to follow this, this will require education of patients, referring doctors, as well as radiologists, regarding the risk of non-contrast CT, as well as alternatives for diagnosis. And we need to be really focused on patient-centered um, care, a team approach. And although this is our algorithms that I think would work in the best of all possible worlds, we have to be very mindful of logistics in the emergency departments in the United States as well as patient expectations. Thank you very much.